This will be the finished isometric bathroom scene in Blender if you want to follow along. I'll be highlighting the most important aspects of the process. We'll also look at the fantastic tools, add-ons, the asset browser with an asset file available on my website all the way up to rendering. Check the description for detailed courses on Udemy. Let's begin in the default Blender scene and if we press N, we open the sidebar where we'll get the cube's dimensions, which are currently displayed in meters. Everyone has their own preferred units for dimensional display, and my own preference is millimeters. If we open the scene properties tab, in the length setting, this can be changed to millimeters. It's important to note this adjustment simply alters the display of dimensions, effectively representing our cube's measurements in millimeters. Also, if we input values within the scene or apply any modifiers, they will correspondingly be denoted in millimeters. If you plan on exporting to other applications, it might be beneficial to adjust the scene scale to match external applications. However, since our work will be confined exclusively to Blender, there's no need to change anything else. Next, we can set up the room and the walls and we can start with the cube. To make this room based off real world sizes, let's first scale it up. It's currently 2000 or 2 meters, so let's increase it to 3500. So we can left click into the X dimension field. We can input 3500 here, tab into the Y and input 3500, tab into the Z and input 3700 and we're all good to go. Bear in mind that anytime you scale in object mode, you must apply those changes. So press Ctrl plus A and we can apply the scale. Until the scale is applied, the mesh data doesn't update with the change. So anything mesh data related can get unpredictable results. Now we can create the walls. So let's tab into edit mode. Let's switch to face select and select the three faces that would be blocking the camera. Press X and we can delete these faces. Now while this looks like a quick room, one thing to remember when working in 3D applications is face normals or face orientation. Long story short, in the overlays menu we can switch on face orientation. The red faces are determined back faces and don't render, saving compute power. Because these were inward facing on the cube, they could remain invisible and nobody would have noticed. But because we destroyed the cube, we need to do something about them. That could be to reverse them, but a better way is in the modifiers tab here, add a solidify modifier to give them thickness. It fixes the color issue as the blue color means outside faces and the ones that will render. In the thickness field, let's input 300 and add some blocks, a cavity and insulation in one go. We can also check on even thickness so the mesh keeps its integrity around the corners. Switch off the face orientation overlay also. Next, we can set the room onto the grid floor as it can be hard work through the grid. So let's come into a front view first. We can also switch to an orthographic view so we can see the model straight on. We need to move this up half the height and 1850 for it to sit on the ground. Press A to select it all. Then just press G, Z, input 1850 and enter. And in edit mode, the origin point of the object remains in place. In this case, at the center of the world, 0, 0, 0. And that can be important for a number of reasons. For scaling, if we wanted to scale this room, now it's going to scale from its origin and makes it very easy resize in place. Or having the origin at its base is also important if you were exporting the model. Usually when modeling, I find it helpful early on to add materials to the objects as it gives you a clearer visual of each object. Each of the different colors can be unique, so let's start adding these in the material tab. If your wall and floor object doesn't have a material, click the plus and add one. We can click and rename this wall underscore zero one. In the color swatch, we can change this, so maybe a dark gray. Then if we hover on the base color, we can press control plus C to copy that value. Then let's minimize the tabs in the material editor for a moment. Then if we come down to viewport display, we can drag this up top. Then expand it. We can press Ctrl plus V to paste in the copied color value. 
This controls the material color in the viewport. We want three materials in total on this object. One for each wall and one for the floor. So click the plus and add two additional material slots. Then for each slot, create a new material. The first we can rename wall underscore zero two. The second, let's rename this floor. Then choose a color for each of these room elements. Next, we need to assign each material to the correct face. So let's tab into edit mode. Select the face in the scene. Then select the wall underscore zero two material. Then click and assign the material to that face. Repeat that for the floor and assign the material to the selection. For the doors and windows, we can use an add-on called Archie Mesh. This needs to be enabled, so let's press F4 and open preferences from here. In the add-ons tab, scroll down a little and you'll find it under Add Mesh, the Archie Mesh add-on. Put a check mark and enable it. We can close preferences and the add-on will be available in the Create tab here, in the Archie Mesh drop-down. We'll start with a door, so let's click and add one in here. This gets added at the position of the 3D cursor, so let's select the empty. In the snap menu, let's switch this to vertex. We can press G, Z and snap it to the floor level here. Then press G, Y and just drag it in a little bit. To open the door properties, we need to select the door frame. The first thing we can do is input 90 and rotate the door around. You can set properties like the width, height, what side it opens on, the model and handle types. The default settings for these can be used or can be adjusted at any time as they are parametric. To create a space for the door in a wall, a hole needs to be cut in the wall object. This requires selecting the empty object, which is the parent object. Let's press Z and switch to wireframe shading. Then press GX and drag back inside the wall. This control hole object here is responsible for subtracting the space, but it's currently not wide enough to completely cut through the wall. So we can select it and tab into edit mode. Press A to select it all. Press S, X and scale out beyond the wall both sides. Now let's tab back to object mode. To cut a hole for the door, a boolean modifier will need to be added to the wall object. This modifier performs a mathematical operation between two meshes, in this case subtracting the shape of the empty from the wall object. Select this wall and open the modifiers tab. In the add modifiers drop down, let's find and add a boolean modifier. Then we can use the picker and highlight and select this control hole object. That will subtract the shape from the wall and make an opening for the door. The boolean operation has also cut into the floor, which is not the intended result. So one fix would be to separate the floor as a separate object. Let's select the wall again and tab into edit mode. Switch to face select, then select the bottom face. Press P and separate selection. Let's come into a front view and make sure we're in an orthographic view. Press Z and switch to wireframe shading. If we switch to vertex selection, we can drag select the bottom vertices. In the snap menu, make sure we're set to vertex here. Then we can press G, Z and snap the wall up on top of the floor. Let's press Z and switch back to solid shading. Tab back to object mode and the floor is now a separate object, so select it. In the modifiers tab, remove the boolean modifier and fix the issue. Next, we can add a window into the wall here. The Archimesh add-on has only two window options, but within each window, it offers a great deal of customization. The base window type we can choose here is the rail window. Then use the empty object to position the window at the correct height and location. It can be adjusted at any stage and probably will be as more objects are added. Similar to the door, the control hole object will need to be widened to fit the window. To do this, we can tab into edit mode. Press A to select it all. Press S, Y and scale it along the Y axis and extend it beyond the wall. We can tab back now and select the wall. In the modifiers tab, we can add another boolean modifier. 
Then use the picker and select the control hole object and cut the window into the wall. There are many ways to configure the camera in Blender, but in this case, we will focus on establishing an isometric view. This process involves two primary steps, altering the camera angle and changing the camera type to orthographic. Let's start by modifying the camera type. To do this, let's open the Object Data Properties tab. In the Camera Type drop-down menu, change the option to Orthographic Lens. This camera type will help us achieve the isometric perspective we're aiming for. With the camera type set, the next step is to rotate the camera to the correct angle, and we can do that from the Item tab. In the X Rotation field, let's input 60 degrees. Tab into the Y and make sure this is 0 degrees. Tab into the Z and input 45 degrees. We can then enter camera view using this button here. To frame up the room and find a good distance, we need to adjust the orthographic scale. Just click and drag and get it roughly into position. This can be adjusted at any stage. Then use the location transform to frame the view. Finer adjustments can be made later once more objects are added and you get a clearer idea of the scene. By default, the camera resolution is set to 1920 by 1080 pixels. This can be found and adjusted in the Output Properties tab. For an isometric view, you might want a square resolution, so adjust the resolution to 1080 by 1080 pixels. Once you've set the resolution, return to the camera properties and adjust the orthographic scale as needed. Then we can continue aligning and framing the camera. Next, we're going to incorporate the bathroom assets into our current scene. You'll find these assets as a blend file conveniently named bathroom assets on my website. The link to these is in the description below, so make sure and get that downloaded. Blender includes a built-in feature called the Asset Library, enabling you to link external Blender files such as this bathroom asset file with your ongoing project. This tool facilitates more streamlined and efficient management of multiple assets and objects. If you're unfamiliar with creating your own asset library in Blender, I suggest you refer to my tutorial, Time to Build Your Asset Library. This guide offers a comprehensive step-by-step -step instruction on how to establish an asset library and then introduce bathroom assets to your project. Although this might take a bit of time to set up, it's a worthwhile investment that will definitely pay off in the future. You might want to pause this video now and refer to the tutorial. After you've set up the asset library, we can switch the timeline editor to an asset library using the editor type drop down menu. Increase the window size for a better view. Once you've successfully linked your bathroom assets, which can be done through the preferences menu, they should appear in the asset library, ready to be used in your scene. Integrating assets into your scene is a very straightforward process. Just drag and drop. A rotation preview for the asset is displayed and it will sit itself on the surface of the object where it's dropped. Once the asset is positioned, activate the Transform Manipulator tool which lets you move, scale or rotate your assets to preferred locations. Next on the list is the vanity. While dragging, the asset provides a preview the orientation might not always be perfect. Most will need orientating, but Blender has useful tools for that. A rotation angle becomes visible when you click and drag on the Z rotation, for example. Blender's snap function comes in handy for precise positioning of assets. In the snap menu, switch the option to face project and ensure snap width is set to closest. Press G and hold control to position the vanity against the wall accurately. Then align it along the Z and Y axes to finish placement. Now we'll introduce the mirror and align it with the vanity. Drag the mirror into the scene and position it over the vanity. This also needs to be rotated. Lift this object above first. Then in the snap menu switch to vertex. Grab the Z-axis and snap it onto the top of the splashback. For correct alignment, select the mirror and shift select the vanity. Go to Object, navigate to Transform and then Align Objects. In the Align Options box, align on the Y-axis. 
This will be the center to center and relative to the active object. That covers the process of integrating and aligning the assets. Now I'll continue to add the remaining assets and I can accelerate this part of the process. Next, we can explore external resources for more assets. There are numerous sources for external assets. We can pull up a web browser. One such website is Polyhaven, which not only provides HDRs and textures, but also includes a models section. Although it's a relatively small collection now, it's expanding rapidly with high quality models added regularly. An asset like the potted plant would complement the bathroom scene. It's a zip file, so ensure you decompress it and we can delve into appending it into the blender scene later. There are various other sources for 3D models online as well, so explore these sites and pick additional models that you'd like to incorporate into the bathroom project. Now let's return to Blender. We can open a file explorer window. Here I have the zipped folder from Polyhaven, which I'll right click and choose Extract All. After it's uncompressed it should open up. We can examine the content by opening up the blend file. Once it loads, we'll see a collection called Potted Plant underscore zero two, containing three objects, dirt, leaves, and the pot. We'll append in these objects from the original Blender file, so we can close this file and return to our original project. To use the append function to incorporate these assets, go to File and select Append. Navigate to the Potted Plant file and double click to access it. And then the collection. Here we can select the Potted Plant 02 collection and append it into the file. These objects appear selected in the scene. Press the forward slash key to isolate them. Currently, these objects move independently, so we'll shift select the leaves, dirt, and finally the pot. By pressing Ctrl plus P, we can set the parent to the object while keeping the transform. Now if we select the pot and move it, all objects follow along. Let's return to Global View. We can move this around the scene and find a good position. That's how you add external assets from blend files to your scene. For FBX assets, it's as simple as going to File and selecting Import FBX. Now I'll speed up the process of adding additional assets to the scene. That brings us on to materials. We can open a web browser for this. The first site I've looked up is Polyhaven, which we've used earlier for the potted plant asset. This platform also offers texture maps that might be useful for some of your materials. Although they could be more appropriate for exterior finishes, it's always worthwhile to explore. The next site on the list is Ambient CG. Here you can view all their assets. Their offerings are more suitable for interior finishes, so you can pick a variety of texture maps for the materials you think will be required. Lastly, we have BlenderMata.com. This site provides a range of procedural materials available for download, so you can browse this material library and download any materials that might be useful in your project. I'll quickly gather several materials for the project I think I will need, so try do the same, and I can speed up this process. Models or meshes that utilize texture maps in their materials will require UV mapping. Otherwise, the materials will appear distorted. On the other hand, models using procedural materials don't necessarily require a UV map. Let's use the floor as an example to demonstrate how to unwrap an object. With the floor selected, we can switch to the UV editing tab. We can press the forward slash key to isolate this object. This action puts us in edit mode, but let's tab back to object mode for a moment. In the modifiers tab, this object gains its thickness from the solidify modifier. Before we apply the solidify modifier, let's examine the object scale. By pressing N, we can open up the sidebar. Before applying modifiers or UV mapping, ensure your scale is uniform. Otherwise, you won't achieve accurate results. Press Ctrl plus A for the apply menu and apply if you have a non-uniform scale on the object. Now we can apply the modifier. Hover over the solidify modifier and press Ctrl plus A to apply it. The final step before UV mapping is to check the face orientation. Access the overlays menu and turn on face orientation. We want to confirm that we have the face normals correctly orientated. The blue color indicates they are forward facing. Let's disable the orientation overlay now. 
we can tab into edit mode. This will be a straightforward UV unwrap, so let's switch to edge selection. We can select the top four edges and get ready to split this section away. Press Ctrl plus E to open the edge menu and mark a seam. Next, select the four short edges around this section. Press Ctrl plus E again and mark another seam. Finally, press A to select the entire mesh, then press U and we can come up and unwrap. In the process of UV mapping, it's crucial to maintain consistent texture resolution across all models. This ensures the quality of textures remains uniform in the final render. While you can make adjustments based on size and significance of objects, for our purposes, we'll strive for consistency. Luckily, Blender is equipped with an add-on called Magic UV that does the calculations for us, eliminating guesswork. Press F4 and open Preferences. Navigate to the Add-ons tab. If you search Magic in the search bar, this should appear listed. Enable the add-on by checking the box. If you're interested, expand the add-on information to find a documentation link that will guide you through the utilities features. For now, we'll stick with the default settings and close preferences. The Magic UV add-on can be found in the sidebar under the Edit tab. You'll need to be in Edit mode to access the Magic UV's three menus. Let's unfold the UV Manipulation tab. Enable World Scale UV, which allows the add-on to calculate and apply the density based on our input. Ensure the setting is on manual so we can enter the values. In the Texture Size field, input 4096 by 4096, which will be our standard texture size. We can also create a test texture to visualize the resolution. In the Image Editor, click New and rename the texture image, Test UV. Set the image resolution to 4096 by 4096 and switch the generated type to UV Grid. Now return to the Material tab. We'll need to be in Object Mode for the next step, so tab back. Then let's remove all the material slots from the floor. Now create a new material. Rename this Test UV. Switch back to Edit Mode. Add an image texture slot to the back of the base color and then we can search for Test UV from the drop down list. In the scene, press Z and switch to Material Preview to display the texture on our object. In the UV editor, remove the textures so we can see the UVs. We can now adjust the values in the target density field. Let's test with 512. Make sure all vertices are selected before clicking apply to update the UV scale. On examining the UVs, we'll notice that the bottom face and the two back faces on this object, which aren't visible, are taking up a significant amount of space. By selecting these faces on the model, we can maximize our texture space. In the UV Editor, enable UV Sync Selection, which allows you to select faces and keep UVs visible, regardless of selection. Scale these faces down significantly as they don't need to occupy much space. Move this minimized area up to the top. Invert the selection by pressing Ctrl plus I. Back in the add-on, increase the density value to 1024 and apply this. From the UV menu, choose Pack Islands, which may slightly reduce their scale for a better fit, and that will be fine. Switch back to the Layout tab now. That will be the process of UV mapping the objects, so I can speed up the remaining UV mapping. Every object is now UV unwrapped, with the test material applied and the density value updated. The results ensure a consistent texture resolution across all objects for the final render. Remember, individual adjustments can be made as necessary. So for example, the walls are the only UVs are reduced because of their size. If you needed these the same resolution, you could separate them. But because I'll be using a paint material, this resolution will be fine. Now let's apply some materials to the objects. Starting with the floor, we'll use tile textures sourced from Ambient CG. Switch to the Shading tab. First, remove the test material from the floor and create a new one, which we'll rename Floor. You can add a texture set using a shortcut provided by the Node Wrangler add-on. If you don't already have it enabled, go to Preferences. Search for Node and enable the Node Wrangler. 
This add-on allows you to use the Add Principle Setup feature found in the Node Wrangler tab in the sidebar. Navigate to your Textures folder and Control select the texture maps you want to include. Color, Metalness, Normal, GL, Roughness. Choose Principle Texture Setup and these will automatically connect to the principled node. You may need to adjust the scale. In this case, input 15 into the X, Y and Z fields. Adjust the X and Y locations so the texture aligns with the edge of the floor. The floor material will also cover the front two faces, but let's apply a different material here. In edit mode, select these two faces, then create a new material slot, then create a new material and assign these faces to that named floor edge. Use the picker to select a color from the floor, then adjust the material settings for the bathtub, let's use a procedural material as an example. Rename this material bath. In the shader editor, make this full screen by pressing Ctrl plus space. Leave the base color as the default off white. Increase the subsurface to 0.1, specular to 1, then roughness to 0.5. Maximize clear coat to 1 for a good material look. So let's return to previous. If I rotate around here, that looks pretty good. That will be the process for the remaining materials. I'll quickly add a mixture of procedural and texture based materials for the remaining objects and I can speed this up. Now for the lighting and for this I'm going to use some area lights. So let's first press shift plus s and put the cursor to world origin. Then from the add menu in lights, let's add an area. This gets added at the 3D cursor, so let's press G Z and drag this up above the room. In the light properties, let's increase the power to 100W. In the size field, click and drag and increase to cover the top of the room. Let's make a duplicate, so press Shift plus D and we can right click. In the Y rotation field, let's input 90. If we come into a front view, we can press G and drag this over in front of the room here and position that out front. Let's repeat that and select the top area light again. Press Shift plus D and we can right click. This time in the X rotation field, input 90. Then if we come into a side view, we can press G and drag this over in front of the room. Now let's jump back into camera view. We're ready to render. Open the render properties tab and confirm that the render engine is set to cycles. In the sampling section, increase the max samples to 1024. Enable the noise to help reduce the noise in the final image. The rest of the settings should be fine, so let's open the output properties tab. We previously set the resolution to 1080 by 1080, which is large enough for our purposes, but you can increase or decrease if necessary. Make sure the file format is PNG. From the render menu, click render image. This will take a few minutes, so I'll speed this up. This render serves as a great starting point for developing this interior scene. Adding additional models and adjusting the light can further enhance the scene, but for now hopefully it gives you some ideas for creating this type of render. If you're happy with your result, save the image.